Simon Groom. Eh, Simon Groom es director de la Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art de Edimburgo. Él, eh, Luis se ha laureado en literatura inglesa en el 1989 eh, preso la Universidad de Edimburgo y poi è andato in Giappone, è nato il suo interesse per l'arte giapponese, un anno a studiare e lavorare. Dopo di qui eh, è venuto in Italia, a Firenze, per insegnare in università letteratura inglese e anche critica letteraria. E poi quando ha deciso di eh, trasferirsi al mondo dell'arte e, e ha fatto un dottorato al Cordot Institute a Londra. Eh, dopo di qui è andato alla Ketters Yard, il Museo di Cambridge, dove ha organizzato la prima mostra eh, in la britannica di Monoha, The School of Things. E eh, dopo Cambridge è andato alla Tate Liverpool, giusto lo stesso anno che io sono arrivato alla Tate Modern, là ci siamo conosciuti. Eh. E là ha organizzato una mostra, la prima mostra di arte cinese importante anche in, Inghilter in, in, in Inghilterra, che si chiamava The Real Thing, eh, New Art from China. E, eh, questo è stato nel, nel eh, 2003 e nel 2007 è stato nominato direttore della Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art dove eh, appena fa un mese ha inaugurato una mostra di Carla Black e Kishio Suga eh, Contemporaneamente si stavano organizzando tre mostre, ma nessuno di noi sapevamo che stavamo lavorando con Suga, solo alla fine l'abbiamo scoperto. L'altra è una mostra che ha aperto la DIA, la Foundation, anche curata da un'antica un curatrice della Tate, Jessica Morgan. Ma tutto per casualità, mai abbiamo parlato. E questa è un'opportunità per che Simon Groom eh, adesso ci parli di Kishio Suga e, della, e de, del suo contesto che conosce benissimo da tanti anni. Simon? Grazie. Woo. Um, good evening. Um, thank you for that introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. I thought I was going to give my lecture in Italian tonight. I'm very disappointed. Actually, I'm not. I'm hugely relieved. We have a fantastic translator. Maria Grazia, thank you. Um, <clears throat> As Vicente said, I did, my first show in Cambridge was with Mono Ha. I didn't really know them. I didn't know what was involved, but I thought it was a good idea. I thought it was a good idea to do something that I knew nothing about. I think it was a good idea to be very naive about understanding all the problems involved in making an exhibition. I had never made an exhibition before. So I traveled to Japan. I tracked down five artists who once formed this group called Monoha. They hadn't spoken to each other for five, 10, 15, 20 years. And I persuaded all of those five artists to come and work with a curator who had never put on an exhibition in a gallery they had never heard of. I still don't know why they did it, but I'm very grateful that they did it. And that exhibition in 2001, I think, uh, was a real eye-opener for a lot of artists in Britain. Even now, I have artists who say, I saw that exhibition. It was amazing. And I know that some of those artists who saw that exhibition didn't see that exhibition, but they say they did because it's one of those exhibitions that you had to see because it had an importance because it was bringing things that hadn't been seen before to the UK. Which is why I'm utterly, utterly delighted, as I said, to be here in Italy, in Milan, 
in the Hangar Bikoka with this phenomenal exhibition of Kishio Suga, which is the first major exhibition of Suga's work outside of Japan. And to have works that go from the late 1960s up through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, maybe into 2000s, is phenomenal. Because the very nature of the works is such that they're very difficult to see. They exist for a moment in a particular place, at a particular time, and then they're gone, no more. Slide. This is the man, Kishio Suga. A bit of a mystery. He looks cool. He is cool. He has a great dress sense. In the 1970s, he wore flares. He was always at the right place at the right time. He's enigmatic. He speaks a bit of English, but not too much. You can go to the restaurant with him, as I have many times in Tokyo, and you can spend a whole evening with him. And with those few words of English, and with the few words of Japanese I have, we seem to cover territory. We seem to open worlds with those few words that with other people with whom you speak the same language, you don't travel any distance. So he's a remarkable man. I don't know what it is about him. Last week in Edinburgh, I met an old Japanese man. Again, he looked very distinguished, very cool. He had a fantastic hat on. And I went up to him and I said, do you know Suga? And it turned out that he had traveled from Japan to Edinburgh. He'd always wanted to go to Edinburgh. So the Suga exhibition gave him the opportunity to go to Edinburgh. And he said, yes, my name is Toshiaka, Toshiaki Minamura. Mr. Minamura is one of the most important art critics in Japan. Mr. Minamura is slightly older than Mr. Suga and was the first critic to write about Mr. Suga. And it's followed his career over the course of the last 40 years. And you know what he said to me? We were standing, looking at an installation, looking at the works in the gallery, and he said, you know, I think I still don't understand Mr. Suga, but I know what he's trying to say is really important. And I think I'm beginning to understand the language, but I don't quite understand what it is he's saying. And there's something about that admission that for me was really liberating. Because when you see the works around you, they are what they are. There's no disguising the material. Stones, rocks, wire, concrete, iron. They're very simple. The form in which they take together is very simple. But somehow, what they communicate is incredibly difficult. Difficult to put into language. And there's something about why artists talk about going to see this exhibition. There's something about visitors who know nothing about Japanese art, contemporary art, Suga himself, which is utterly compelling. This is the kind of work, I think, that says something in a language 
that maybe we don't understand. And the more you learn that language, you don't come closer, but it gets deeper. And certainly for me, with my experience of having worked with Mr. Suga now since 2001, I can't say I'm any closer to understanding. So if you came here today looking for meaning, you can leave now. There will be no meaning. What I'm going to try and do is to put him in context. I'm going to look at where he comes from, a bit of Japanese background. Because we're in Italy, a bit of Italian, what was going on here, background. And then a bit of international, and I'm going to bring it up to date with the contemporary, contemporary sculpture. That's a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to do it very, very quickly. Sakine. This work, 1968, was the first work that brought this artist and a movement called Monoha to attention. Earth dug out of a hole three meters deep, two meters across. They were just going to take it out and just scatter it. And then one of the artists who he's working with said, let's stack it up. So it looks like a trick. You remove a plug or a cork of earth and you put it beside it. And in fact, for the artist, that's what it was. It was a kind of visual trick. But other people read into it something far more the scale of it, the simplicity of it. There's no artist's fingerprint on this. It's to do with the earth. It's something substantial, something solid. And it was the impression that the raw matter, earth, had that for the artist and for other people around him was so important. So Kine said something, I need my glasses, I'm afraid, to read the quotes, which is a real bore getting old, but there we go. So Sakine said about this, the universe exists in a constant state of being, neither losing nor gaining matter. Therefore, one cannot really create, one can only expose what is there. The most one can do is to remove the dust which is laid upon the surface of a thing and expose the world beneath. It's a really lovely idea that an artist's job isn't to create something from nothing, it's to reveal the world as it is. This is another work he made just afterwards. It's one ton of oil clay. All it is is, oil, is clay, and to stop it going dry, it's had oil put in it. I showed this in Liverpool, at Tate Liverpool, and it, I think it was the first time it had been shown probably since the early 70s. And it was phenomenal because you see this massive mass of dirt in the gallery. But your brain, as someone who is creative, inventive, wants to shape it. And so we would leave, the we'd leave it in the gallery and people would make figures out of it. They would see faces in it and, and pinch, twist faces to come out of the clay. And that's fantastic. We all have that will to impose our own idea upon material. But for Sakine, it was the material that was the most important thing. So where does this idea of material come from? 1955, there's a group called gutai. Gutai means concrete, i.e. hard, solid, physical, matter. And gu is tool, and tai is substance, gutai. So it's a tool of substance. And this applied to a group of artists who, after the defeat of the Second World War, wanted to start again new beginning. If you think about what was happening in Europe at the same time, exactly the same thing. You think of Dubuffet or Vols in France. You think about here in Italy. You think of those artists like Capogrossi, 
Arcardi, who were trying to find a new language that would take art into a completely different direction. If you think about one year previously, in 1954, and you think of someone like Asker Jorn, who was in Albisola, very close, who with his motorbike was cycling through the mud. And that for him was a work of art. So it's not just in Europe, in Japan, but it was lots of countries. The idea of starting from what is most primitive, most instinctive, starting again, finding new value. And these Japanese artists, that's what they did. They wrestled with material. And here's Shirago again. And it wasn't the act of building these. It was the act of, of with the ax, chopping. They didn't paint. They threw themselves. They were violent with things. Here's Shirago, who's painting with his feet. There's a rope up there. This is in his studio. I went to visit his studio when he was much older and the rope was still there. And he painted with his feet, and sometimes he didn't use canvases, but he used boar skin. Shozo Shimamoto, a bit like abstract expressionism, but completely uncontrolled, completely violent, and out of the violence came the work. Here he would put paint in glass bottles and smash the glass bottle, so the paint would explode over a surface, and then he'd show the surface. Murakami, running through the paper, and again, the idea of physical event, destruction becoming creation. Really, really important. And again, if you think to Italy, at the same time, you had people like Buri, with his katrami, and his saki, just the sackcloth, starting off doing something with material around him. In this, with the paper, you think of Fontana, for example, and the idea of the buki, and coming out of the spazialismo, the idea that there's a new world waiting to be discovered, but it's not the old world, it's not paint, it's something very different. And the leader of Gutai talked about material like this. The arts appear to us as fakes. These objects are in disguise, and their materials, such as paint, pieces of cloth, metals, clay, marble, are loaded with full significance by human hand and by way of fraud. So that instead of just presenting their own material, they take on the appearance of something else. Gutai art does not change the material, but brings it to life. Gutai art does not falsify the material. In Gutai art, the human spirit and the material reach out their hands to each other, even though they're opposed to each other. The spirit does not force the material into submission. If one leaves the material as it is, presenting it just as material, then it starts to tell us something and speaks with a mighty voice. Keeping the life of the material alive also means leading the material up to the height of the spirit. So material and spirit together that they're going to release. So forward 10 years to Monaha. So Monaha used materials, the matter, that spirit of Gutai but it wasn't just materials. Here are the very simple materials of paper and rock or stone. This bag is actually about two meters wide. It's massive. The stone inside is a couple of tons. Putting the stone in the bag is a real problem. We did it in Cambridge at Kettle's Yard for the Monaha show but it was the juxtaposition, the contrast between the bag and the stone that was important. Liu Fan was the main theorist, the main uh, leader of putting together the philosophy of Monaha. And for him, it was about bringing things together, not just matter, but different types of material. 
So here we have rock, glass, and steel underneath. He picked up the rock, he let go, so it smashed the glass. And in smashing the glass, the glass becomes visible through the cracks. And it's that confrontation, the chance meeting of rock, glass, and steel. Very different from surrealism, the chance meeting, of the umbrella, and the dissecting machine, dissecting table. This is, again, the idea of matter being more than the artist, being more than the creator. And his idea was not just matter, but where matter is, where you place something is really important. So his paintings, where he takes a line, is all about where you start and where you take it, and the relationship between one point, as he called the next series, from point and another. And so for him, like Sakine, it wasn't about creating something from nothing. It was about creating something that was already existing, but making it visible. I've got a quote from him. The highest level of expression is not to create something from nothing, but rather to nudge something which already exists so that the world shows up more vividly. He called this a relationship of tension that was necessary to the artwork. And the relationship of tension isn't concerned with things in and as they are, but the difference between them. So we come to Suga. And Suga exemplifies, for me, that idea of where something is placed more than any other of those Monaha artists. This was an um, installation that he did very early on in the museum in Kyoto. And all it is is two bits of wood propping open a window. But for Suga, what was important about this is the idea that, as he put it in the label, the materials of the work, the materials of the work, the wood, the window, the room in front, and the view behind. So for Suga, the work is the wood which makes visible the relationship between what's in front of you, the window frame, and behind. It pulls it together. Bit of a tricky one. These works of Suga's are, this is from uh, the Tate, um, which they bought this work uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there's something about the way Suga has this idea of uh, one thing depending on another. They look incredibly fragile. They're tied together, the rope, the uh, wire around the stones. You're not quite sure what's supporting what, what's dependent on something else. And if you look at all these works, every single one of Suga's works, there's an idea of fragility there. That the materials might be robust, but the way they're put together, it feels at any moment as if they could collapse. At any moment, it might just become nothing. And there's that sense of fragility, vulnerability, and gravity that, for me, defines his work. It needn't be like this, but for the moment, it is like this. This is one of those works that you have to tell people about because it's just so awesome to see. And certainly, the installation that you have at the end here is the biggest example of it that there's ever been, probably that there will ever be. And it's just phenomenal. I'll show you a slide at the end of a much smaller installation at the gallery in Edinburgh. But again, that idea, it doesn't have to be like this. The wood is just found wood. The objects placed where the wires intersect is just a marker. It's nothing more. They don't have to be like that. That blue one doesn't have to be blue. The yellow doesn't have to be blue, uh, yellow. The bits, scrap pieces of wood, 
are just found. At the end of the exhibition, they'll be thrown away. There's nothing intrinsically valuable about the wire, about the things that are balancing on them. They just happen to be like this for the moment. And it's a beautiful idea that you use material, but the materials aren't important. Everything you see around here is made of stuff that you find in do-it-yourself shops, or in building sites, or in the wood, or in a stream. And you pull them together, it's do-it-yourself art, but of a kind that's just incredibly balanced, incredibly fragile, incredibly thoughtful, that for me develops its own kind of language. And there's a kind of coherent rigor through all the works. And I still haven't quite put my finger on what that rigor is, but it might emerge. This is the Japanese bit. Um, for me, Suga is an international artist, but he's also very Japanese. There's the idea of materials that are at the heart of what Japanese culture thinks about itself and its relationship to the world. This is one of the most famous temples in Kyoto, and I suppose it just stands as an example that in all our societies, but especially in the Japanese culture, there's the idea of materials that you can do something very simple with, and it has resonance, and there's a tradition. And in effect, Suga's simply picking up on some of that. About material, Suga has very, has expressed his views very clearly. So I'm just going to read what he says about material. I use many different types of basic materials. This is because each material has a different identity and reality. I've spent many years questioning what mono, so mono means both work and material, so what mono material and what reality is. But to be frank, it is still difficult to say exactly what these things mean. I mean, bloody hell, if it's difficult for Suga to do it, then for me to stand up here and do it is really, really impossible. We're surrounded by all kinds of mono, and by looking at them every day, we have a broad understanding of their shape, colors, size, mass, and the roles they play. In my practice, I'm presenting mono, but what constitutes these mono is not simply their external appearance. Rather, in many cases, my work consists of invisible phenomena expressed through mono. They make themselves visible to you, but what they consist of is the feeling one has in observing them. One can infer the presence of something, something that cannot be seen, yet can be felt, that underwrites the existence of these works. That something is the structure of meaning. So it's a very dense passage, but there's an idea that every type of material has its own resonance. But that's not revealed until you find a structure, and it's in the structure that that meaning comes out or is revealed. And again, that work in the corner exemplifies that idea of placement. It's made for a particular space, and that work will change. It will still be rock and rope and branches but it will change according to where it's shown. There's nothing, again, unique about the materials. It's about the form, the arrangement, the structure that's the key thing about the work. Everything can change. It's the structure that remains. And it's the idea of the placement, that disruption. Um, Suga would take, this is one of uh, a series of photographs that he took when he would go for walks in Tokyo, in the parks of Tokyo. And he would just um, see something, bits of matter, branch, bit of paper, and he would just arrange them so that they would assume a different form, as if there's a structure there that he was trying to create or maybe reveal. And these photos, I think, are really revealing. They seem to be of nothing, but yet seem also at the same time to have a real charge.
So doing shows in galleries, Suga would bring in various things and give them a structure that responded to the gallery space. There's nothing permanent about these things. They can be taken apart. As he says, they were part of a world of transience, which again is a very Japanese and Buddhist idea. This is part of what he um, also did, is kind of activating, um, it called actions, and he um, did lots of actions. And in fact, for the opening of the exhibition here, he did an incredible performance that lasted 40, 45 minutes. And it was never quite clear what he was trying to achieve or when he knew that he would have succeeded in finishing it. And it was very poignant because uh, it was all about balance again. And he had a stack of objects that he used, bits of stone, rock, tin, rope. And it was almost like he was making it up as he went along. There was a certain point when he finished and he knew that was it. And this thing stood, fragile, slightly wavery, slightly uncertain of itself, and then just appeared to exist like another thing in the world. I mean, for me, it was a kind of a, quite an amazing moment. So, this then brings us back here to Italy. Um, obviously, um, we kind of live in a global world now, but there's a lot of uh, information being communicated between artists and they had things like biennials and art fairs and magazines. And there's a lot of information going backwards and forwards, particularly between Italy and Japan. In Italy, there was a gallery in Turin by, uh, run by Luciano Pistoi. It was called Le Notizie. And in 56, or 58, I think it was, they put on an exhibition of the Gutai artists in Turin. As you know, Turin, as Turin came, uh, a couple of those artists who would then go on to become part of that movement that now is known, or then was known as Arte Povera. In Tokyo, similarly, three Arte Povera artists were showing at the Tokyo, Tokyo Biennale in 1970. And that Tokyo Biennale was really important in terms of establishing the idea that across the world, there are artists who are using matter, and in effect, trying to get rid of the boundary between a work and life. And in a way, it's where that boundary found itself that distinguished the work from life. And it was about that erasure. And here we have, so I'm gonna talk about a little about um, those things that seem to be the same, but in fact, might be very different between Arte Povera and Monoha. So obviously the first thing, looking at it, is that use of the found object. So here we have a found sculpture, but also rags. I mean, those things aren't normally associated with art. But actually, they're really colorful. There's a kind of dialogue going on here between the past and the present. Germano Salant, <clears throat> the main agitator, theorist, critic, curator, who brought the term arte povera into being, and who, in effect, bound those artists together through his theory spoke about the impoverished um, materials. But it wasn't so much the impoverished materials, it was a way, I think, of um, really rethinking that engagement between what a work is and what its relationship is to the society. Again, that boundary between a work and the world that encloses it, that surrounds it. There's also a bit of anti-commercialism, that idea that you bring things in and it's not for sale. Again, that's very pertinent to Monaha, because everything they made wasn't really made for selling. It was made at a particular moment, at a particular time, for a particular space, and then it disappeared. It wasn't to be recreated. Pistoletto again, and the idea of mirrors, I think. I'm just going to twin a few works just to draw out their similarities and differences. So the idea of the mirror was really important in art. We've always thought about uh, painting, in effect, reflecting, being a mirror or a window into the real. The use of pistoletto mirror, it wasn't up at painting height, it was on the floor. So it invaded your space, 
physically, and I think that's a really important thing to remember. But it's also political, this slogan for Vietnam or anti-Vietnam. And again, that's a big difference with Monaha. But again, I think it's interesting looking at the use of the mirror. Here's Sakini again. And he uses this mirror, and there's this big stone at the top. But the uses of the mirror are very, very different in both cases. For Sakine, it's very that idea of time passing, those reflections that you see yourself, you lose yourself, everything's passing. But at the same time, everything remains the same, symbolized by the rock. It's there, it's not going to move. It's a fantastic object. It's both permanent and impermanent. And that's different from the use of the mirror in Pistoletto. Mario Mertz, this great, great work. Again, the use of um, brushwood and the metal, the construction. And then Suga with this work, again, that's just around the corner. So again, same materials, but a very, very different end. There's something very mythical. There's something that plugs in with Arte Povera into a wider currency of cultural association that, again, is very missing from the Monaha works. The Monaha works, it isn't about making references to nature, making references to industry. They happen to be objects, materials that come from industry and from nature. It's not trying to comment upon the cultural society. Yanis Kunelis, again, that shock between the promise of a doorway, an entrance, a way through to something which art gives you, and then brutally, actually in this case, rather beautifully blocking it off, bringing the outside world into the gallery. But unlike with Suga, it doesn't take you through, it just blocks. This is the, um, my gallery um, currently, and we've got one work that we put just at the entrance of the show, again, just to show you the difference between Cunellis block doorway, which we have shown, and a Suga block doorway. Again, same frame, different use. This for me is lovely. Um, Giovanni Anselmo, the idea that he had when he was on Stromboli, and I know probably all been to Stromboli, where earth, fire, air, time, they all seem to meet. And Anselmo's epiphany was seeing the sunrise, sun come up, and just being blown away, from what I understand, that consciousness of being part of this physical, dynamic universe of which he was one tiny part. And I like to contrast this with Enakura. And again, it's the same idea of using your body as a measure, as your contact with the world around you. And for me, this is one of the most beautiful, moving pictures in the whole of art. I mean, for me, this is the one work that um, I would love. Um, and it's just so simple. Enakura was part of the Monohar artists, one of the Monohar artists. And he, in here, you can see that there's a longing to be part of the world, but also that kind of consciousness of one's separation from the world that one wants to belong to. And it's both an infinite longing, but an acknowledgement that that longing will always fail. There's something really moving about him. But again, that's very different from Giovanni Anselmo. This is another work by Enicura, and it's photographs. He did these amazing photographs. And the photographs, this is a bit of oil on stone, which just brings out the materiality of the stone, just makes visible something that's always there. And I love the fact that it could almost be anything. There's no context for it. He took lots of photographs of things, the everyday world. There's no context, which in effect just makes him become part of that world. It's not about him with his mind saying, I am lord of everything I survey. He's very much part of this world. 
And then, of course, we get these kind of works that eventually take us to the idea of American minimalism. And, of course, with Pina Pascale, this cubic meters of earth, it's a bit of a parody of American minimalism because, of course, this is earth. Earth doesn't come out like this. But it takes us back to Sakine and that idea of the earth coming out and being bound together. And of course, when you think about the minimalists, you think about the object itself, the materials being very cool, industrial, preconceived, rational, um, made for the space. So if the ceiling was lower, you would take out a few of the stacks, very anonymous. Where's the artist? Does the artist's hand have to be here? It doesn't. It exists almost out of time. And as we've seen with Monaha, they very much exist in time. Robert Morris, who is the main theorist of both minimalism and post-minimalism and process art and land art, and here the idea of the L-beams is that they're that shape because they, they assume a different size and scale as you go in, depending on how you place them. And the idea for him was to have something that looks very anonymous, but actually it has an impact, even through the anonymity of the materials, upon the visitor who goes in to see them. Here, felt, again, very anonymous material. The idea of gravity pulling down. And lastly, scatter piece. So these 200 objects, steel, wood, felt, that are rearranged in any order you want in a gallery. Even though Robert Morris was a great theorist of art, I really don't, I mean, he's a good artist, but they don't do, for me personally, anything. They lack life. They're an idea that's been illustrated. Robert Morris, for me, is a great writer. He's not a great artist. And I'll probably be, well, anyway. <laughs> um, because there's something very inert about this. And the objects themselves also assume they're random pieces of, of, of material. But for Robert Morris, these materials themselves constitute the work. So that when you want to reshow the work, you have to borrow these pieces. And that's very different from all the works you see in here, where, as I said before, you make the pieces yourself. And again, the idea of land art has been really important, and the idea that the whole of life, the earth, the sea, everything becomes open for art. And of course, that was taken to an extreme by Robert Smithson and the Americans. And there's a whole history this is the mythical first moment when land art was made. And of course, it would have to be in Central Park, in New York, by Klaus Oldenburg. This is the myth, and it's called the hole. And it looks like a kind of a grave that's being built, and then it was going to be filled in afterwards. And of course, it assumes a political connotation because it's uh, Vietnam and bodies were coming back and everything. But this is the foundational myth for land art in the way that art history is written. This happened a couple of years earlier, but in Kobe, in Japan. And of course, uh, this group, Group I, fascinating group, really experimental, doing all kinds of things that even now would be considered really radical, decided that they would make a hole next to this river. It dug a hole and then filled it in and walked away. But nobody knows about them. And again, it comes back to narratives of power in art history. Who writes art history gets to tell the story and then dictate how art history should be shown and seen. And that's why uh, having someone like Suga and Monaha and Gutai become part of art history is so important. And actually, while I'm on this subject, I'll continue. So um, I showed you a slide earlier 
from the Tate. And the Tate's been really good at going around the world and being much, more, much less uh, Western-centric. So going to Latin America and going to the Far East and going to Africa and acknowledging that art is produced everywhere and it all has importance. But what's terrible about that is that when they show it, they show it to, in effect, annihilate all that is different about that art. So in that room that I showed you before with Suga's piece in it, it had land art, it had arti povera, and it had minimalism. And they become examples of the use of poor materials or materials. That's one aspect of it and not a very important aspect of it, but that's the way now that most visitors will have to this very, very important art from the rest of the world. And I think, actually, it's quite shockingly disgraceful because it homogenizes art from a very different culture doing a very different thing and actually does it a disservice in the end. Anyway, rant over. Richard Long, the idea of going out, making a work, leave a trace, and it disappears afterwards. John Baldessari, the Californian West Coast conceptual artist, what I love about this is the idea of trying to make art. Art you know, comes from anything. And for me, the comedy lies in this and throwing up the balls, trying to get a square in the sky. And the amount of labor you need in order to have that coincidence, that chance to create a work of art that looks like it's being constructed. And you compare it with an early work by Suga, where there's a ball on a string, and he simply throws it into the sky. And that, for him, is making the work. There's no rhyme or reason or logic behind it. Every time he throws it, it's going to be different. It's just chance. But they're really moving. For me, they're kind of an example of, of something that's incredibly arbitrary. It should have no importance. But it assumes importance but it's because it's been fixed in time. And they're different and they come from such economy of means, such a simple thing. Again, very different from Baudasari. Baudasari, this is a video from 71, where he just raises his arm saying, I'm making art. And for him, again, it was about that boundary between the world and art. And he was trying to see how little he could do in order for something to be made or be called art. I bring that up because, in effect, this is what all this work around us is doing. It's about the boundaries between the material, the structure, the world around us, and what we call or think about as art. Last bit brings me on to the contemporary. Martin Creed, British artist, um, also tests the boundaries of what is real and what is art. This is a work in our collection, and it's 370 balls, just balls, different shapes, sizes, all thrown together. This work, things that are similar, boxes, chairs, that idea of assemblage. So in a way, it relates to Suga and the idea of structure. But there's a, there's a family resemblance here that Creed is really um, working on, and it's about stacking. I don't know what you would call the action that Suga does to make his work. It's not painting, it's not stacking, it's not arranging. I don't even know whether you would call a work a work. Is it an installation, an arrangement? I just don't know. Maybe it is just making a structure. But Martin Creed has something similar in terms of approach. Eva Rothschild, again, a British artist, and I've got a quote from her somewhere that I just want to read out. Um, okay, there are two ways of making, the subtractive and the additive. So you can take things away or you can add. My process is additive. This way of working leads to an accumulation of separate elements. 
creating a diversified whole which presents as complete at the moment of exhibition. But always implicit in its presence is the possibility of change or collapse through the removal of one or other element. This acknowledgement of a lack of permanence and stability is at the heart of my practice. And you should just compare that with Suga when he says, my works always seem to be on the verge of completion, yet unresolved. So for contemporary artists, for contemporary sculptors, there's that idea of fragility, balance, taking away, adding elements of something. But at the end, that possibility of failure, which I think is a nice idea. Here's accumulation gone mad. Phila de Barley, she's representing Britain at the next Venice Biennale next year. And I thought she was worth um, including, just again, because of the accumulation, she's like the kind of eternal bag lady. She will see things, she will pick them up, and she will make art from whatever it is. These are just old pieces of wood that she makes into these very arbitrary structures. They've got no narrative behind them, they're just these things put together. So again, it's that idea of accumulation. But with her, there's a certain formality. There's aesthetics at play to do with color and form and size and balance. The last three artists I'm going to show you are what is really hot. Um, the Turner Prize is a prize that the Tate has every year in which it showcases the work of four artists under the age of 50 as being in the vanguard of contemporary art. And this year, all four artists are sculptors. I'm not sure whether they call themselves sculptors, but certainly when you look at the work, that seems to be the closest to what it is they're doing. And this work by Helen Martin I thought was quite interesting um, because, again, it's taking things from everyday life. So there are pots and plates and bits of wood and the bits of pipes. And what she's done is she's made objects out of them. So she's making things that have a kind of, they kind of resemble something slightly but don't quite fulfill it totally. So they're allusive. They seem to suggest something. So in this way, they're a bit like surrealism, that they make you look more closely at things that are familiar whilst trying to create something totally new. But again, I like that idea of addition, bringing things together, different materials together to create something new. So the technique might be the same, but a million miles away from Suga. Michael Dean. The title tells its own story. United Kingdom poverty line for two adults and two children. 20,436 pounds sterling. So this is the amount of money that a family, two kids, two adults, needs to live to be above the poverty line. And there you can see that sum in penny pieces in 1p pieces, and has taken 1p out of that. So in effect, if a family had to live on that, they would now be below the poverty line. But again, the different use of material. And for Michael, he starts his work with ideas of the alphabet. And again, it's kind of interesting coming back to Suga's idea of the alphabet, or as of uh, the work being like language. And these really are based on words and letters. They're there as a kind of reminder that art is in itself a language. That's just a gratuitous picture, which um, in a way is symptomatic, I think, of um, the way that, uh, I mean, it's very easily consumable for social media. And in a way, there's something about that in the art that will be, is being produced, shared, consumed. It actually comes from a design by the Italian uh, designer, Gitano Pesce, for an apartment block in New York that wasn't realized. But Anthea Hamilton has done her research and has recreated 
the maquette for it as part of her installation at the Turner Prize. Lastly, um, this is the exhibition in Edinburgh. You've seen the exhibition here. I thought I'd share with you the exhibition in Edinburgh in case you don't manage to make it. Very easy, two hours, easy jet, direct flight. The weather is like here, cold, blue skies, beautiful. Food's good too. This is a work outdoors. So again, Suga works outdoors, plywood, stone, very simple, discontinuity. You put, you have something uh, that's quite flat, quite standard, and you put in an eruption into it. You disturb it. You disturb the structure to reveal it, to make it visible. This is in the first work. You can see we've got the window open. We've got it closed now because it's so cold. So we've closed the window, taken that work away. And again, it's really interesting. This is zinc and stones. We got the zinc and we put the stones on. And uh, Suga asked for um, the tear to be made in the zinc that is the same height as the stone next to it. And if you look, you can see they are all pretty much a formal similarity. So there's a kind of structure, there's a kind of order, there's a reason behind it. But then he gets bored, or he thinks, actually, that's too reasonable. That kind of thing doesn't exist in nature. It's man-made, it's an imposition. So he doesn't follow through with his own logic. And if you look closely, there are lots of stones there, or some stones there, where he then doesn't pull up the bit of zinc or he doesn't put in the stone that should correspond to where the zinc's been put up. So in a sense, he creates a structure and then subverts it himself. So this is our little left behind situation. This work is the first time it's been remade since it was shown in a gallery in Tokyo in 1972. And for me, this is a really key work. It's got lots of elements. Um, it's got that kind of idea of going through, going down, having a structure, and that's stones being put within the structure of the fencing that goes around. And I was always intrigued by the fact that the fence has been cut here. And I was kind of having all these things about um, the idea of... Um, uh, Eastern art being kind of horizontal and uh, Western art being vertical. And all that means is that uh, there's, a, there's a theory about how if it's horizontal, Pollock, for example, took the painting off the wall and put it on the floor. And if you make it horizontal, it means you're part of what it is that you create. You're part of the world. So you, yourself, you are amongst the things of the world. Vertical just means that you're above it. You can look down on it. And it's about you using your mind and impressing your will upon things of the world. And there's a big debate about whether actually Eastern art is horizontal and Western art is vertical. And here I was always intrigued by, you know, was, was this what he was playing on? And was this the door through that kind of unlocks the vertical and the horizontal? It's got nothing to do with that at all, as you might have suspected from Suga. He made the work in a gallery, and it was only when he finished having made the work that the staff realized that they couldn't get into the office that was behind here. So they had the fence come down. He'd made the work, then staff, amazing. How are we going to get into our office? And so he just cut a hole in it. So it's just a practical thing. Staff can now get into the office by walking through the work. And for Suga, that's what I love about it. The idea that there's nothing sacred. It's contingent. If circumstances change, he will change the work. It's not there forever. It will vanish. After this exhibition, this work, it goes. It doesn't get boxed up or crated or, or sold or, or sent back. It just gets taken apart. Constituents returned, and that's it. And this is the new work he made for us. It's a very, very big room, our biggest room. The gallery used to be a school. 
and it was built in the 1840s. And this is the big assembly room in the middle. And what Suga's done is we've got a rock and then four ropes that go up to the sides and middle. Not quite symmetrical. Again, to have it symmetrical would just be to undermine, I think, or to impose a reason, a man-made reason upon the materials. But it looks right. And there's a tension in that room that is unbelievable. And uh, we have a visitor's comment book, and everybody comments on this work. And almost everybody agrees that it should be called catapult. Because there's the idea that even though you see this rock is hugely heavy, that at any moment, the tension, it will just disappear through the roof. There's something extraordinary that Suga does. And we paired Suga with Carla Black. Carla Black, Scottish artist, uh, was in the Turner Prize about five years ago. Uh, so female artist, Scottish, in her 30s. Suga, Japanese, in his 70s, early 70s. They didn't know of each other. But what I loved was the fact that they use common materials, but their works are so completely different. And I think it's only in showing difference that you can understand what something is. So Carla uses balsa wood and cotton wool. Manzoni used cotton wool. And there's the idea that with Carla, um, things are always in the point of just collapsing or about to collapse or have collapsed. There's the idea of entropy, things being on the edge. Cotton wool, polythene, sellotape, glue. She, calls, she considers herself a sculptor, but they're very beautiful. And the material she uses to make the color, she often uses eyeshadow, um, glue, lipstick. And she uses those materials because they produce the best color. It's not about their cultural connotations. It's not that they're female. It's not that they're pastel colors. It's that they produce the best color. And she says, if you could get powder of different colors that you didn't have to mix up with water as you do with powder that you buy from the art shop, she would be happy to use it. So for her, the best materials are not art materials. They're just other materials because for her, they produce the best result. And all her work seems to be on the edge, about to collapse in this state of uncertainty. And like Suga, all her work is made site-specific for the place that it's intended to be shown. And so for her, all these works are new. For Suga, all but the one work is a recreation, but a recreation made especially for the space. And this is a beautiful work, just made of polythene and a bit of powder, very ephemeral, very light, but beautifully balanced, the two works together. This is the last slide, and I bring us back unapologetically to Japan. There's something for me, it's not Japanese, but it is Japanese. It's something very international, but also very local. And for me, I think the best art combines the two. It's something that can speak, even though you're not quite sure what it's saying. And in a way, it's a bit like moss or stones. These things exist everywhere. But there's a way that we look and think about moss and stones, even though they're the same in Britain, Italy, Japan. We approach them differently in Japan because there's a different conception about their place. And for me, that's what Suga does. He brings a different conception of those materials that surround us in everyday life and I don't know how he does it, but he communicates something richer, deeper, stranger to us through his very poor materials. And for me, that is his genius as an artist. It's not an answer, it's a beginning, but it's great that here we've got an opportunity to have a look at them. That's it, thank you.